All right. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's course. Um, before we start, just uh, again, some organizational remarks. So the practicals start today or the practicals started actually last Thursday when I put the uh, the first assignment online, but the uh, the, the assessments where, you, where the teaching assistants are present in the room are starting today. So again, there are no groups, neither for the tutorials nor for the practicals. The groups are just online on a series because the system doesn't allow us to reserve rooms without having groups. That's why we have to make the groups there. But uh, for practical reasons, uh, it's uh, it's no no point to have really group assignments. So you can do or you should do the exercises for yourself, uh, both the tutorials and the practicals. But uh, there are then time slots where teaching assistants are around and then you have to go there. Or you can go there to whatever time slot fits you best and then you can ask them questions. Um, the only limit that we have is, of course, the space limit because uh, there are only, uh, especially for the, for the practicals, there are only 15 computers, so a maximum of 30 students or a little more if you have a group of three. Um, so if, uh, for example, after the lecture, I would expect that it is quite crowded there. So if you can, if, uh, can do this with your schedule, I highly recommend that you choose another hour to go there. Good. Um, we will, we're also planning to set up a forum because we're doing this practicals the first time. We completely change it. So a lot of the things will be a little chaotic because it's new for us as well. So be patient with us. And we want to set up a forum so we can also give you first uh, quicker information if there is some questions. And also you can ask questions there or you can, you're also then welcome to, to answer questions that others give or uh, uh, you are you're welcome to post uh, hints there about the technical installation and the stuff. Of course, no hints about how to solve the assignments. Good. Um, yeah, deadline for the first assignment is next week on Thursday. If you're still looking for a partner, um, please go to the practicals directly after the lecture in room B, uh, BBL 175. Um, I told the teaching assistants that I sent all the people who don't have a partner yet there, so they know about this. So go to the teaching assistant, and if everyone is there, you can do some sort of a quick speed dating, and then hopefully you find a partner for the assignment soon. Good. Um, yeah, tutorials uh, today are is the second tutorial session, which still covers the first exercise sheet. So I said that uh, each exercise sheet is basically we have four tutorials which teaching assistants present for one exercise sheet. So the next exercise sheet comes online on Tuesday because Thursday and Friday the university is closed because of the holiday on Thursday. So no uh, events then, but um, starting next week and then we have the second assignment. So the people who already had the first one or who will have it today can then go on Tuesday or Thursday either next week for the second exercise sheet. And as I said uh, last time, there are much more questions, uh, more uh, exercise on this exercise sheet that I think most of you can do in two hours. Um, but uh, the idea of this is, of course, first of all, we expect you to do more and not just come here and sit here during the scheduled hours but you have to put in some additional effort uh, for yourself as well and the other thing is of course uh, i mean each year i have an idea for a new one or two new exercises so i put them in addition to that but i don't remove the old exercises because i think if i already have them why not let them there so you have more exercises to practice for the exam but of course the natural uh, consequence of this is that there are more and more exercises each year, so of course you cannot do everything in two hours. So don't be frustrated when you're not able to finish everything in two hours, but uh, yeah, use it as a, as a possibility to get more practice. Good. Um, yeah, any questions about the organization? No? Good, then let's uh, start with the uh, today's content. So today we'll basically uh, continue where we uh, where we started uh, where we finished last time there are a few things that i didn't uh, make because of the time so i have to, uh, i want to finish that up and then we move to from 2d to 3d talk a little bit about normal vectors and if i have enough time i will also talk a little bit about shading if not i will do it uh, next time Good. So, uh, yeah, since we already had a lot of uh, uh, things introduced last time, just a, a quick summary to catch up. So if anything of this doesn't sound familiar to you, I highly recommend that you 
look into last week's lecture because, um, as I said, there is a lot of material in this course and the major problem of this is, I think, more, uh, it's not the difficulty of the material, it's more the amount of material that you need to know. Good, so we, uh, we introduced vectors last time. We started with uh, um, like a definition of vectors, then we said how we can inter or we, which two definitions actually, which are uh, uh, work equally well and basically lead to the same thing. We said uh, how we can interpret vectors, uh, algebraic and geometric, which is related to the two definitions, of course. Talked about the difference between a vector and a location, and also about some special characteristics of vectors, vectors that are parallel, vectors that have a length of one or a length of zero. In the last case, we even introduced a special term for these vectors, unit and null vector, because they are so important and you will see today that we're using them a lot. Um, and then we talked about how can, or we can do calculations with these kind of vectors. So we introduced the scalar multiplication. We said how we can add and subtract vectors. And then we introduced two kinds of multiplications of two vectors with each other. One was the dot or inner or scalar product. And the other was the cross product. And both of them have, have one important characteristic each what, uh, for the dot product it's that the uh, it is proportional to the cosine between the two uh, of the angle between the two vectors and the cross product is uh, the important characteristic here is that the result is orthogonal that is means in a right angle to the original vectors and we will see today examples for why this is important and why these are so important characteristics um, of course they have other characteristics as well we talked about this as well and then we also introduced uh, uh, the basis of a coordinate system or we introduced coordinate systems by introducing base vectors we also introduced a special uh, base uh, which is the orthonormal base which is a base that is built from orthogonal unit vectors so this defines basically spaces in which we yeah, can do something and this something was for example uh, specifying certain geometric shapes so we talked about implicit representation of circles and lines so we learned how we can represent a circle and a line and uh, we also in that context actually this should more go here uh, we also introduced another special vector, which is the normal vector. So far, we only talked about normal vectors with respect to a line. So a normal vector with respect to a line is basically any vector that has a right angle to the line and or is orthogonal to the line. Um, and today we will generalize this to uh, uh, random uh, geometric objects. And also uh, we, we talked about this, as you see here, this is the implicit representation of uh, these objects. Of course, there are other representations and one of them is the parametric representation, which is uh, the thing I want to finish up now. Um, just a comment, I kind of indirectly also, either if you're familiar with this, I repeated it. If not, I introduced it. Some basic mathematical uh, things like trigonometric functions and the Pythagora Pythagorean theorem. So uh, those of you who are, have problems with these things or are not familiar with it, uh, I also recommend that you, for example, look in the book about, uh, in the chapters about that. It's not really that much difficult, but uh, yeah, you have to know it. Good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... Uh, as I said, the implicit representation is just one way, of course. Uh, of course, there, are, there is uh, basically an infinite number of ways how we can represent objects in a, in a mathematical way. And the implicit representation is one of it. It's kind of an indirect definition because we do not like we're used to from school that we have like a function where we put in an x value and then we get a y value out but we have this equation that is equal to zero so we can basically very easily verify for example if a point is part of a geometric object that is specified with this implicit equation by just plugging the point numbers in and then seeing if the equation is correct or not but uh, it is not that intuitive or more difficult to like calculate the points explicitly um, so, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we have different kind of representations. Um, and uh, for example, one of the things that would also be quite useful sometimes is to be able to address a function or, or a, a, a geometric object in 2D by just one parameter. So for example, think about a line and when you want to walk along the, along the line or want to move an object along this line, of course you can do this by having two 
points on this line and constantly calculating these two points. But you could also, it would also be kind of nice if you have some sort of an, an index or just one parameter that allows you to just move from one position on the line to the next one. And this is basically what this parametric representation is about. It is basically in 2D the idea to control a geometric f uh, form, a curve by one parameter. So we see here we have x and y, these are our points on the line and they are calculated with this function g and h that depends on one single parameter. So you can think of this as some sort of an index. So you have a t which is your index value that leads you to these two function values g t and h t which are your x y values. So this represents this point on the curve and then if you go from t to uh, t plus 1, for example, or to t minus 1, you get the next value in that direction or the next value in that direction, depending on how you make the unit. Of course, it's plus or minus 1 or something else. Good. So you have some sort of like an index that index indexes all the lines in the right order, all the points on the line in the, on the curve in the right order curve, I have to say, because the line is, of course, a very specific way, uh, um, geometric object, and we want to represent this in a parametric equation. It looks something like that. So let's uh, try to understand what this means or why this really gives us the part, why this represents a line and why how this uh, allows us to address all points on the line by controlling just one single parameter. So if we look what we have here, we have a point P0. Let's try to draw this here. So this is a vector P0. Then we have oh, we have a point P0 on the line and we have a point P1 on the line. Um, let's make here P1. And then we see here the line is defined by the point P0 and the vector P1 minus P0. So P1 minus P0, we know from last time, this is just taking the inverse of P0, putting it at the end, uh, at the end of P1. So this is P0 minus. And then this is our vector P1 minus P0. And now you remember that vectors are not locations, they re can re be used to represent locations, but the vector is independent of the location. So if we say here, let's assume for, uh, for the start that t is 1, so let's just ignore it, then we have p0 plus this vector p1 minus p0, that means we go p0 and then plus p1 minus p0. So that means we end up here and of course if t is 1 then we end up at the vector p1 here because we have p0 plus p1 minus p0. So this is correct, but if we go the way all these from all these vectors, of course we go this way. And then we have this parameter t here, which also if you remember last time what we learned about scalar multiplication, this is basically just a scalar multiplication, a multiplication of a scalar with a vector. And we know that a scalar multiplication does not change the direction of a vector, with the one exception, of course, the direction in the other direction if it is a negative value, but only modifies the length of the vector. So by using different values for t, so for example, if we take t, any random value from r, any random real value, we can basically get all points here in the direction of this vector here. So this is t times this vector leads to, for example, this value here. Or if t is negative, we can also go in this direction. And now it becomes obviously clear from the image that this is basically a line. And it also should become clear how we can control this line or how we can access each point on this particular line by just this single parameter t. So we have a line in 2D that is represented by two coordinates, each point is represented by two coordinates, but we can control it with just a single parameter. Good. Um, yeah, so this is a little uh, nicer image, but because I was not sure if I am able to draw very well, but it actually worked out quite, quite okay. Good. Um, 
yeah, so we can also write this, of course, in this way, and this is just because uh, because of the general. Um, I put this there because of this general definition. So you see here, you have these functions g and h. So if we use that notation, then it becomes clear what these functions are. Good, and uh, so you see, we basically defined this line by having these two vectors, and in a literature, or sometimes uh, we also find often the terms support or direction vector, or alternatively, uh, some uh, books use the terms position and displacement vector for this. And uh, the, so the idea is basically you have one vector, the support vector, which gives you a location in your 2D space, and that vector is fixed. And then you have a direction vector that starts on this location and points in a certain direction. And that basically gives the orientation of the line in the space. And then you have the parameter t that allows you to basically walk along that line that was specified by this direction vector. Good. Yeah, and uh, so we see now we have two ways to represent an uh, <coughs> represent represent a line, and this this uh, second I personally find this second one more intuitive because it gives you this idea of having a position and then a vector that points in direction, and then uh, you can basically walk along that line. Whereas with the normal vector, this is uh, seems kind of less intuitive, and we don't have this nice parameter that we can control it. But of course. The reason why we have this implicit representation is that in certain situations it's just easier to understand certain things or easier to calculate certain things and we will see this later with examples. So there are different ways of representation and if we have different ways of representation we are also often in a situation of course that we have it in one representation but would actually like to have it in another one. So the question is how can we convert that and that is basically the uh, exercise number um, 11 from the first tutorial sheet which um, so, which is why I don't want to go that much into the details. We will post also uh, uh, some not complete solutions, but comments on how to solve the questions from the tutorial sheets. Uh, I will post that online, but I will only do this um, before the uh, midterm exam and before the final exam, because if we do it now, it encourages too many people not to go to the tutorials and not to do the exercises. And as I said, if you do that, if you uh, then you run in the problem that you will uh, probably get lost and not be able to catch up. So this is why we, we don't do it now, but we will get some, some information about this uh, online as well. Yeah, so uh, I, I think you, you basically should uh, be able to figure this out yourself. So just, just an example. So for example, if you have either of these two representation and want to have the parametric equation, then you see here what you need to build that is basically two points on the uh, on the line to be able to to uh, specify this parametric equation. So what you could do is you could just take two points, so for example for x uh, is 0 and x is 1, plug them into either of these equations and then you get the two points and then you can easily write down the parametric representation. The other way around, it's pretty much the same. It's just a little more complicated because you don't have to need points on the line, but you, for here you need the normal vector and you need to specify this parameter b, for example. Good, but you should be able to figure that out. So, we have the uh, parametric equation of a line now. We have the parametric equation of a line where we have one parameter that allows us to basically walk along the line and get all the points on the line. Now, if we want to do this for a circle, we also want to have a single parameter that controls where we are or where we can go on the surface or on the, the line that specifies the, on the curve that specifies the circle. Um, so, uh, any idea what kind of parameter this could be? The angle, exactly. So if we have a circle, then uh, we know the center of the circle and we know the radius. And if we had and know also the angle, then we are able to very easily access each point on a circle. And also the angle is continuously increasing 
until we make a full circle 360 degree so it is a very good and intuitive way to control all points on a circle by one single parameter and we do this by these two equations here if we have a yeah if we have a, a circle with uh, around the center c and with the radius r and uh, we can easily see that by looking at these trigonometric uh, functions here. So, for example, if we look at uh, uh, a triangle with the right angle here, and we have the sides, if this is uh, representing... Ah, that was not... If this is... Uh, a vector, let's call it V, then this is the X value of the vector, this is the Y value of the vector, this is the length of the vector, and if it is on the line, oh, I should have called it P. Anyway, um, <clears throat> then this is, uh, the length of this vector is, of course, the radius of the circle, and here we have the the angle phi, and then we know from trigonometry that the sine of phi is defined as y divided by r. So we see here y is r times sine of phi, and the cosine of phi is divided as x divided by r, and then we see x is r times the cosine of phi. So this is exactly this here, uh, this part here. And then, of course, if we have a circle that is not around the origin but around a, a center c, then we just have to basically move everything by this vector c. So we just add the coordinates of this c to it. Of course, um, this with a triangle only works still the, uh, till the angle of uh, almost 90 degrees for phi, but uh, you know from last time the you know, sine function and the cosine function, how they are defined. So if you continue from there, it just goes to the negative and then you basically have the same, same relationship here. I just use the triangle relationship here also to kind of repeat those uh, trigonometric functions and the relationship to the triangle, because that is also needed very often in the lecture. Good. So uh, so we know now how we can represent objects by uh, an implicit equation and by a parametric equation, but so far we've just described curves in 2D, and now, of course, in graphics we want to most, we're mostly interested in 3D objects, so we want to move now from a 2D, so from a curve to a 3D, so from a curve to a surface, so, uh, oops, that's wrong today. To, from 2D we want to go to 3D now, from a curve to a surface. And let's start again with the implicit surfaces. Um, so you see here this is basically from the general definition. This is the 2D case and this is the 3D case. It's just a straightforward generalization by just adding another parameter here, a third parameter to this function. Of course, it's a straightforward generalization in the arithmetic case. Uh, considering drawing, it's not straightforward because we cannot draw in four uh, in uh, in, uh, in in four dimensions because we would basically to have a function from three parameters to a fourth one, we have to draw in four dimensions, and that's uh, uh, hardly possible. Um, and that's why, of course, you start with a 2D case, but it is a straightforward generalization, as we see, for example, with the, the first case, which is the sphere. So if you remember, the 2D case of the sphere was basically everything beside this sphere, and this is just the third coordinate added to this equation. And similar to the 2D case, we also see, uh, the 2D case was the, the circle, we see also for the sphere why we come, can come up with this, or why this is intuitively clear that this equation if the points fulfill these equations that they are on the surface because it basically means that oh I forgot the vectors here that sorry for that um, 
we basically see that the uh, the length of this vector of each if, if a point p is on the line then the distance between p and the center which is the length of the vector between these two points here is exactly r if and only if it is r then the point is on the line and if we write this we can then do just some arithmetic changes we can write it like that and then you know that the uh, the length of the vector is defined as the square root of this and if we put this to the power of 2 we get exactly what we have here in this line so you see that this is uh, indeed intuitively clear that this equation fulfills the, the need of the sphere good um, <clears throat> similarly the, the 3d uh, representation the 3d equivalent to a line which is a plane is also just a straightforward generalization by just adding the third coordinate here and like in a 2d case where we said that this vector a b the coefficients for the parameters x and y or here for x y and z are a normal vector in that in for the line it was a normal vector uh, vector in a right angle to the line here it is a vector in a right angle to the plane but it is again a normal vector um, I have uh, proved this for the 2D case at the end of uh, the last lecture. So uh, if you don't remember it or as a good exercise, you can prove it also for 3D now with three coordinates. It's just a straightforward generalization. Good. And then we see, uh, again, we also have this, uh, this value D here. And of course, the question is, again, what is this meaning of this value D here? Now, to repeat, if you think about remember the... Uh, The line case in 2D, we also had this in, in vector form. We have the normal vector, and then we have this vector P, and then we see that this value B is basically this vector P0 that points from zero to from the origin to this position here, which is 0B. So we see here that B is basically the distance of the line from the origin. And we also see this here that if we put in uh, 0, 0, 0 for x, y, and z, we get, we get f of 0, 0, 0 equals d. And then um, that's not correctly written. f should be uh, 0, but uh, um, if we make x, y, and z equal 0, then it follows that uh, the uh, I I just don't know how to write this correctly, but you you understand what I mean. It's it's obvious that this is basically the distance of the plane from the origin on the set axis. Good. So um, <clears throat> you uh, if we yeah if we if we put this in vector notation of course we can also put this in vector notation and then we get this here and um <clears throat> then uh, so this is pretty much the same as with the uh, with the line and uh, the, the point is now to to think about what this means also compare it to the to this uh, parametric equation where i said we have this support vector that basically gives you a position of the of the line or the play uh, in in a 2D space or a line uh, plane then in a 3D, and then we have this direction vector that says to shows you where the line points at, and here for the implicit representation, a way to think about this geometrically is also that we have a position of the plane, which is the parameter d, and we have our orientation of the plane, but instead of using a support vector, a uh, direction vector, we use a normal vector, which is orthogonal to the plane. So if you have a plane like this, you have one uh, normal vector pointing out, and then by turning that normal vector, you can change the orientation of the plane in the space around this fixed position that is, in a parametric case, specified by the support vector, and in the in the implicit case, by the by the parameter d. Good. Of course, there are exceptions of this um, if the line or if the plane is parallel to the line that is specified by the set axis. So uh, if this is the set axis and for example, we have, if we look at it in 2D, 
So let's say uh, the x x uh, the y axis is pointing towards me. This is x and this is z. Then of course a plane that goes like this is uh, then d is not indicating this value here. So these are the kind of special cases that you have to to consider as well, of course. Good. Um, yeah. So we are. Uh, we can specify now two dimension, uh, three-dimensional objects with the implicit equation, a, a sphere and a, a plane. Uh, we can also think about, wouldn't it also be possible to just have like some um, sort of a one-dimensional-ish uh, um, curve? Um, it's, it's not, it's not one-dimensional because it's in three-dimension, but you, you, if you look at the image, you can understand what I mean by one-dimensional-ish. It's basically something that goes along one single line. And the question is, could we also represent this with an implicit, cur uh, implicit equation? And uh, the answer is, unfortunately not. This will not work out. If we want to represent something like that with an implicit equation, we have to define it as an intersection between objects that we can specify. For example, if we want to specify a circle in 3D with implicit equations, we have to specify it as the intersection of two spheres, as illustrated in this image here. This works, but of course, this is not really very comfortable. Fortunately, for that we can, for this kind of things, we can use the parametric equation. We can use parametric curves because they allow us to control such uh, objects with one single parameter in 3D, so we can specify something like this. Of course, the general case is with two parameters, but let's first look at just a single single example of this here. So this is basic, is for example, if we have a function where we, the x is the cosine of t, the sine is the sine of t, and z is just the value t, then we can describe a three-dimensional, uh, like a one-dimensional-ish objects in 3D. Um, I tried to make some illustrations here that makes it a little easier to understand what it is. I hope it works. So this is basically, um, if this is uh, our x-axis, this is our y-axis, and this is z, which is the same as t, then the cosine of t is something like this here, so we are in this x and y plane, and then uh, if we look at the x, the, the plane defined by x and t, then this blue thing here is the cosine. If we look at the plane defined by, again, t or z and y, then this is the sine function, and if we combine these now, then we see for each next value, set increases by one, so we walk along set in that direction. The x, y value depends on the blue line, the y value depends on the green line, so if we move up here, we go at the same way to the right side, and when we're at the right side, we continue then backwards when we move up, but we go to, uh, that was uh, now, oops. So we start here, we go in that direction, and then we go back to this here, and then we go to the left, and then we go to the front here. So you see, in the end, you end up getting a spiral. So if I would have drawn it better and longer, it would look like this in 3D. So we see here that we can really create 3D objects by using this one parameter that controls it. Um, but of course, the more general case is to use parametric surfaces, um, to use parametric surfaces for which we need two parameters to describe the characteristic or the shape of the surface. So this is the general case. So let's look at some, some examples and uh, oops, probably I don't know, something, it's too early in the morning, everything's going wrong. Here we go. Good, so maybe the, the most straightforward case to, to see this is, uh, again, a sphere. 
because for a sphere, think about first a sphere centered around the, the origin. Um, we said that for a circle, it was very natural that the angle is a good way to control it. For a sphere, we have two dimensions, so we need two angles. And probably the most familiar way where we know this is from the Earth, where we can describe each position on the surface of the Earth or on a map by the longitude and the latitude, which are basically nothing else than two angles. So we have first one angle, which is on the Earth, the, the longitude, which is specifies the direction in this, uh, if this is uh, X, Y, and Z, then we have an angle C that specifies the position in the X, Y plane, and we have an angle theta. So for example, if we point in that direction, then we need another angle theta that specifies it in direction of the set axis. And then we have here a point or a pointer in a certain direction. And if we limit the length of that pointer to the radius r, we get exactly this uh, uh, a point on the, on the sphere. And so we can describe it by this equation. And again, we see this by looking at the tri trigonomic uh, functions, the relationships that we have in a triangle. So if this is set x and y, let's assume we have here our vector p specified by the coordinate values set x and x, y, and z. And uh, so, that is, I should use different values here, because that's confusing. So let's say uh, p x, p y, p set. Then we know here that this here is p x. Uh, if anyone knows a different, better drawing tool, let me know. That is p. No, that is wrong. Ah, oh, great. So this here is PX. This here is PY. And this here is R because it's the length of the vector, which is on the sphere. So it's the radius. And let's call this line here just A or the length here just A. And then we have the, the angle phi here. And we have the angle theta, which is actually I was drawing it uh, wrong. The angle theta is usually that angle here. So we have theta here. And then we see from the uh, trigonometry, so the cosine of phi is, so we have here this equals r times cosine of phi. Cosine of phi is defined as x or px divided by a. And the sine of theta is defined as a divided by r. And if we, yeah, we immediately see that this is px. So I should write p's here. I've chosen p instead of x, y, z because I realized that this is confusing with the uh, the axis, which I also labeled p, y, z. Good. So yeah, we see immediately that this, this is clear. And for this here and that here, um, I think, uh, it should also be clear when you try it yourself as a as an exercise. Good. So now we have uh, described a sphere, but a sphere around the origin. Of course, we also want to describe a sphere at around uh, a random center in our space. And uh, the same, yeah, this is so easy. I'm, I'm afraid to even ask this. It's the same as we had with the circle. We basically just add this. Again, I forgot the, the the arrow here. We just add this vector here here to all the vectors on the point, and then we basically just move the whole sphere to a new center by adding just the vector c. Good. Yeah. So this. Um, <clears throat> Like uh, like I said, the, the parametric equation of a line for a lot of people, including myself, is often seen as more intuitive than the implicit representation of a line because you really have this vector that points in a certain direction, the direction of the line. <clears throat> um, but the, uh, the implicit equation of a sphere is often not seen as intuitive as uh, 
the uh, the parametric representation of it, which will uh, cover sooner parametric representation of a line, because um, mm, and yeah, most mostly because we we cannot represent it nicely with vectors, but we have these trigonometric functions here, and we cannot represent it as a vector, because we have this this uh, product of the two parameters here, the the two angles. Um, but you will see later that it's very convenient when we want to do texture mapping, where we basically put a texture on the surface of the sphere. So we need to access each access each point on the sphere, and for that, this uh, implicit equation works very well. Um, parametric representation. Good. All right. Yeah. So parametric planes. Um, the uh, the parametric uh, representation of a plane is basically just the generalization of the parametric representation of a line, just to 2D. So if you think about in a 2D space, you have a line, and in a 3D space, then you have a plane, which is basically the same. You have a position of the plane in a 3D space, like I said, with the implicit equation, and then you have a direction or an orientation of the plane in a 3D space. And to specify that orientation, we need more than just one vector, we need two vectors. So uh, for a line, we have a support vector and one direction vector. If we move to 3D, we need another vector. So we need two vectors on the line, and these two vectors allow us to specify our uh, plane here. So by these two vectors, I often draw it like this to illustrate that this is a plane, although it, of course, extends to the infinite. So um, <clears throat> The uh, and and if you if you think about what what this is or uh, if if you want to understand why why this defines a plane, you just have to put it in relation to what we said last time when we uh, introduced the uh, basis and the coordinate system for a two D space. We said that if we have two vectors that are linearly independent, then we can express all other vectors in this two D space by a linear combination of these vectors, and this is basically what we have here. We have two parameters s and t, and we have two base vectors v and w. So I, uh, I purposely choose a different notation here to also make you a little familiar with the different notations, not to confuse you more. Although I would assume that it might be. Uh, less confusing if I would stick to one notation here, but the problem is if you look into the literature and then you look into the APIs that you need for practicals and then you look into another API or another book, everyone uses a little different notation. They are basically all the same and it's easy to understand what they are and how they, they stick to, but you just have to make yourself familiar with them. That's why I have chosen a different notation here, so not to confuse you. So we have here basically a linear combination of two vectors that are non uh, not parallel. So this is the important thing here that we these vectors on the plane need not to be parallel. And these define then a 2D space. So we can address all vectors in this 2D space. Now if you think about what is a plane in a 3D space, a plane in a 3D space is basically just a flat 2D subspace. So if we are able to specify uh, to address all vectors in a 2D space by a linear combination of two non-parallel uh, vectors, then we should also be able to address all vectors on a plane in a 3D space if we have two nonlinear vectors on the plane. And this is exactly what we have here with the vector v and the vector w. And we have, but then we have just the vectors on the plane. Then we also need to know where the plane is. That allows us to specify the orientation of the plane depending on how we put the vectors there. But we also need to, of course, know where the plane in our 3D space is located. And this we can do with this again vector that we again call support vector. In this case, it's the vector P0 or P as I specify, uh, as I wrote it here. So I was not really consistent here, so remove that P here. Good. Yeah. But be careful, this is a very common and very annoying mistake in, in exams always that people confuse if you have like, if we have a 3D coordinate system, we can use three points, P0, P1, and P2 
to specify a plane that goes through these three points, but if we do it with the parametric equation, we need, of course, the vectors, the support vector, and the vectors on the plane, and not these two vectors. So if you make the equation here, make sure that V and W are the difference between P0 and 2, P2 and P1 and P0, and not P0 and P1. Good, yeah, so we can use three points to specify a plane, to create the parametric equation of a plane, but we can also use, of course, three points to specify a triangle. And, yeah, because I'm, because of the time, I will do this after the break, so 15 minutes break.